There's a phenomenon called retirement syndrome. And when a senior executive retires, a disproportionate number of them have a heart attack or some other type of cardiovascular or adverse health event soon after. And the reasons for this aren't fully known. It could be related to diet. It could be related to a variety of things. But one of the, the things that people think is highly correlative is stress and hurry. These people are very talented in their business lives, but they redline their lives for decades, right? They live on adrenaline. They rack up this very large health debt and they have a pace that is frenetic for most of their lives. And when they finally stop and slow down, their body catches up with them and the bill becomes due. Fighting this temptation is really hard, right? It's changed somewhat. We've made tremendous strides, for example, in normalizing sleep. But to a large degree, our culture still lionizes the person who's constantly in a hurry. And it's literally killing us. Carl Jung is famous for saying, hurry is not of the devil, it is the devil. And it's understandable, right? There's this feeling of importance that we attach to our lives when we are in a state of hurry. We feel like our jobs are important, that we are important, that we're doing something meaningful and impactful in the world. And that explains why we're rushing the way that we are. We also have goals in our companies uh, or our businesses that either are self-imposed or are imposed from our boss or our board. We're literally uh, on the hook for certain objectives. And so that also is an argument for why I need to rush as much as I do in order to hit the targets that have been set for me. But it's created what psychologists call hurry sickness. It's this constant need to feel like you're in a hurry, even when there isn't actually anything worth hurrying for. As a result, our health suffers, our relationships suffer, our ability to think suffers, our souls suffer. Is there anything that we can do about this I, I, that doesn't involve completely blowing up our lives? I believe that there are, and I'd like to walk you through some of these uh, in today's uh, episode. The first one is to recognize that you have a problem, right? It's uh, to have awareness of the situation. For any change of any kind to happen, you have to recognize that there actually is a problem. As long as you don't think you have a problem, you'll continue to operate the way that you have. You also need to have a vision that change is possible, right? If you don't believe that you can do anything about it, you're very unlikely to actually make any sort of changes. And so we want to uh, be aware that something is off, but then also believe that it's possible to make a change. We wanna have a vision for our lives that it is possible to be productive, uh, member, a productive member of society while also being relatively peaceful. There's that old proverb that says, without a vision, people perish. And I think that that's true. You need to have a compelling vision for your life that is free from hurry. I think the third thing is to recognize that busyness and hurry are not the same thing. There's going to be times when you are busy, uh, when kids need to go to their activities, when uh, you have a deadline that you need to hit. You're going to have seasons of your life, days of your life, weeks of your life, where your calendar is relatively full. But a full calendar is a symptom of busyness, not a symptom of hurry. Busyness is an external state, whereas I define hurry as a condition of the soul. And I think it's, it is possible to have a busy calendar, but having a, have a peaceful heart. It's possible to be busy, but not be hurried. How do you, so how do you practically do this? I think one of the first things and most important things that we need to do is we need to eliminate our reliance on our phone. And we need to learn to exercise some discipline around the use of our phone. For many people, uh, probably you, and for definitely me for most of, you know, at least the last 10 years of my life, you know, my phone was attached to me from the moment that I got up until the moment I went to bed. And the average person clicks, taps, or swipes their phone 2,600, or yeah, 2,617 times per day, which is just astonishing, right? And that never ending stream of notifications from email and Slack and social apps create a continuous loop of context switching, right? And startups especially have gotten very good at understanding game mechanics and learning how to architect experiences to get you coming back and using their product, right? And I've taught about a lot of those game mechanics uh, at Kellogg and other places. But when you think about you have 20 or 30 apps on your phone that all know how to do that and all leverage those to great effect, they train you to be less focused. They train you to flit from thing to thing constantly. And that feeling of switching from this to this constantly over and over again contributes to this state of hurry, I think, and has a disproportionate impact on that, that state of, of hurry that you feel. 
And so I think it's imperative that we learn how to control our phones. Disabling notifications is super helpful. Using focus mode or do not disturb mode, I think is super helpful where, you know, nobody can get in or nobody outside of maybe your spouse or your kids or whatever can get through is super helpful. Putting screen time limits on your device might be helpful. There's even apps like Freedom or Opal that will um, completely lock you out of certain applications uh, and there's no kind of workaround for them. They're, they're, they're designed specifically for that purpose. And the fact that there's a market for those, I think is symptomatic of this issue and the need for these. And so, you know, some of these solutions might sound silly to you or they might sound overkill, but honestly ask yourself, do I have the level of self-control necessary to make these changes myself? And if not, take advantage of these tools. They're crutches and they're, they're like medicine. Hopefully the ultimate goal is that you don't need them, but while you do need them, take advantage of them. Uh, number two is uh, batch email and chat, right? So just because you put your phone on do not disturb does not mean that people are not going to be needing to reach you, right? The world does not stop just because you do. And so, but many of us, I think, live, uh, you know, with our email open on our desktop all day long. And that puts us, again, in a, in a mode where we're constantly context, context switching, where we're flitting from thing to thing. And it also puts your life in a constant state of reacting to other people's um, needs for you, right? And you feel a little bit of a cortisol increase whenever you see a new thing come in and you have to try to interpret what that thing is and what it's for and what it means, right? And you just end up living your life kind of at the whim of other people rather than moving forward on the things that you need to be moving forward on. And you end up creating a pace again where you're jumping from this to this to this to this, which contributes to a hurried state of mind. So instead, I would argue that you identify a couple of times a day to batch this stuff and to catch up, right? And I, I don't wanna trivialize this, especially if you're in a professional services context, this can sometimes be hard to do, where clients have needs, uh, where part of the value proposition is your availability to respond. But you know, I, the way I would explain it is, imagine that you were in a meeting with another client, right? And that meeting was a two or three hour meeting. If you don't get back to the other client who sent you an email because you're in that meeting, you don't have a, a, a existential issue with that or a moral or ethical issue with that because you know you're busy. You need to exercise the same discipline even when you are making agreements with yourself. Agreements with yourself to move important things forward are not less important than commitments that you're making to be in that client meeting or whatever it is. And so just trust that when you are batching those things, you can get back to them uh, an hour or two hours later or whatever it is. I would also encourage you, batching doesn't mean uh, doesn't have to mean five minutes. For some people, they they might have a lot of email to process and a lot of things that they need to read and understand what the implications of those are. Uh, so batching for you might take an hour or two hours or whatever it is. That's that's okay. The point is to get in the habit of single tasking, right? Where if you eliminate these these notifications and these things that are kind of constantly pinging you, and instead you look at them at dedicated times when you know that that's all you're doing, that will decrease this state of hurry and it'll allow you to be just as productive if not more productive because when you're focusing on email that's all you're focusing on when you focus on slack that's all you're focusing on when you focus on text messages that's all you're focusing on and then the rest of the time you're present with the people that you're meeting with you're productively moving forward on your most vital task and you will have a more peaceful heart as a result of this Number four, implement a task management system. So in my group uh, coaching program, one of the major tent poles of what I call a personal operating system is task management. And you need to have a way to process all of the open loops in your life, figure out what they mean, and organize them into a system that you trust that you know you will get back to at certain times. And not doing this creates a situation where you have open loops uh, that are kind of occupying part of your conscious or subconscious headspace at all times. Your brain thinks that it has to keep these in its head, otherwise you're going to completely forget about them. And so it allocates energy to these things in a way that is wholly unproductive, right? Um, either you're worrying about something when you're at the ba your kid's baseball game and you're not in a position to really do anything about it. We'll create loops that just play over and over again. The scenario of the negotiation that you have to have or the difficult conversation you have to have tomorrow just plays over and over again. And you're not strategizing, like you might think you are, but you're really just ruminating and kind of keeping it in your head so that you don't let it slip and you don't drop the ball, right? 
And what this does is your mind has this situation where it's jumping from thing to thing because it, it, it feels like it has to uh, in order to not drop them. And it creates a, 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 a state of frenzy uh, in your in your headspace, which then ends up manifesting itself in your actions. And so we want to get those open loops out of our head, organized into a system that we trust that we will review at an appropriate cadence, and that will allow your brain to relax. It'll trust just like your your calendar, you, you're not constantly thinking about where you need to be in 30 minutes or where you need to be in an hour because you've parked it into a calendar and you trust your calendar. You want to do the same thing with a task management system. Number five, document, delegate, automate. So for every person, most people who have been in business for any period of time recognize the importance of documentation and recognize the importance of delegation. And yet most of them don't do it or they don't do it nearly as sufficiently as they could. And so they end up having too many things on their plate and it's compounded because I think a lot of times the the impediment to delegation is that they haven't documented the process if they're honest and that sounds hard. But the cost of that is that they're either winging it all the time or they're reinventing the wheel each time and everything kind of falls on them. And so I advocate that you document literally everything that you do more than once. And that applies to your professional life and it also applies to your personal life. And you should turn it into some form of a standard operating procedure. So that sounds obvious in a professional context, but like have a process for how you do grocery shopping, have a process for how you do the landscaping, have a process for how you do laundry, have a process for how you do your weekly meeting that you hopefully have with your partner or with your kids, as we talked about in the previous episode on running your family like a business. You should turn those into a standard operating procedure and then for as many of them as is relevant or as you can, you should delegate or automate and push those things uh, push those things down to free you up to focus on the things that are most important to you. And many people bristle at this idea, especially if they have a job and they work for somebody else. They think that their company will frown on them for doing this, uh, like they're just trying to kind of get out of doing their job. But I would argue that one of your duties, regardless of your role in the organization, is to progressively push work down to the cheapest possible resource because this allows your company to scale because it can now leverage less expensive talent. It can, it can train up lower skilled people to do the process because there's a system that allows them to do that. It creates more margin for the business because now they can do the same job less expensively, which creates more margin for them, which they can either um, allocate to their investors or they can allocate to their team in the form of raises and things like that. And ultimately it helps the company become more valuable because it has a system instead of just a group of smart people who are winging it. People who acquire other companies like to buy systems more than they like to like, yeah, buy people because systems are acquirable and they're durable. People are, are fickle. People leave. Um, the system is an asset. The people are a resource. And so a smart company, a smart manager will want you to be thinking like this. Now, will they let you have your own personal assistant immediately? Probably not. But delegation uh, doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have like your own chief of staff or something like that. You can just delegate it to, to uh, if you're a director and there's roles that historically have been director level, maybe those can become associate level work or senior associate level work. If you can prove that that can be done through the documentation of a system and the training of that system, you can show people that you can push that work down. And then the other piece of it is automation, right? Low code tools, no code tools, AI tools, things like that are allowing us to automate many, many more things. And if you get familiar with some of those tools, you get familiar with tools like Zapier that allow you to kind of collect, connect two disparate tools together, allow you to run tasks on an automated kind of cadence. If you get really good at those kinds of things, a lot of aspects of running reports, a lot of aspects of do this when this happens can become automated, which will also free you up. So a document, delegate, automate as much as you possibly can. Number six is create cycles of intensity and rest. So I've talked about this previously around the idea around intensity. Um, output is a function of intensity and time. And most people tend to focus on the time lever, thinking that if they need to get more done, they need to work longer hours. But intensity can actually create the same results, especially when it's compounded or complemented with intelligent documented systems, right? So intensity and focus can be cultivated with practice. And we talked about this and gave you lots of um, techniques that you can use in that previous episode. But start small, uh, 20 minutes at a time, work your way up. Ultimately, we wanna get to a place where we can do three to four hours of deep focused work per day. That doesn't have to be in a single session, that can be broken up into multiple sessions. But 
uh, in order to do that, you also need to have cycles of rest, right? Let rest allows you to recharge. It gives you the energy that you need to be focused when you need to be. And I think, you know, as it relates to this idea of hurry, it trains your body to downregulate rather than being on all day long. I think one of the other flaws of the, you know, work more hours to get the out, more output thing is that it it contributes to this hurry sickness, right? It treats, it makes you think that you have to be constantly on grinding all the time, where if you can learn to get the same amount of work done in a focused session of three hours or four hours, you're getting as much, or ultimately I think as you get better at it, more done than a lot of the people that just put in the hours. But more importantly, you're creating cycles of renewal. Uh, that allow you to downregulate and allow you to become less hurried over time. So again, you might be busy for those three hours, but you are not hurried as a kind of state of your soul kind of all day long, right? So rest can be small things like a 20 minute break, a short nap, um, a mindfulness practice, like a you know meditation thing with headspace or whatever, a non-sleep deep rest protocol. It can also be macro, right? Optimizing your sleep is a huge unlock because it, it just, it, it translates into literally everything else that you do. And so, you know, you think about it, you spend a third of your life asleep, right? So you should probably give it the time and the attention and the resources that it needs to optimize that and to get that really dialed in. What rest is not though, is looking at social media, binging on Netflix, right? Your, your brain is not actually winding down when you're doing this. And so that doesn't mean never listen to podcasts or never watch Netflix or never look at social media, but it does mean don't confuse those things for rest. They might be fun. They might be rewards. They might be candy. They are not rest. So treat those as two different things, right? Have a process for when you, um, or, you know, have, have, have times when you watch Netflix, have times when you do legit rest. And then lastly, develop a practice of solitude. And this is probably the most countercultural suggestion that I would make, but I think it might actually be the most powerful as an antidote to hurry sickness. Solitude unplugs you from the world and it helps you learn that the world gets by literally, you know, really just fine without you, right? It, it trains you to stop associating your identity with your work. And in solitude, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. You're not going somewhere with a book or a journal, like you're going somewhere by yourself, no distractions, no phone, no book, and you literally do nothing. You just, you sit in a chair, you walk in nature. When you start first start trying to do this for any sort of extended period of time, you probably take a nap because your brain, uh, you, you find yourself like when you unplug and you, you truly slow down, you get sleepy. And that's your brain, like that's your body telling you like, hey man, you've been grinding too hard for too long, right? But you don't do anything productive. You don't journal, you don't take notes, you don't get caught up on the pile of reading, right? That's accumulated in your life. You don't use, it's not a strategy session to plan out your goals um, as, as important as I think those things are. And I've talked about those elsewhere. You know, you're, you're, you're literally doing nothing and you're teaching your body that it's okay to do nothing. And if you're like most people, you're not gonna be able to do this for very long. Uh, especially in the beginning. And so you maybe start with an hour. You find a, a quiet room in your house maybe, or you go sit at a park and you just try for an hour and you don't do anything. Eventually you can work up to a, a state where you can do this longer. You can do this for a day or you can even go for like a retreat, a couple of day retreat or something like that. And there's, you know, there's, there's places like monasteries and things like that that actually welcome people and they know how to deal with you when you get antsy with this kind of thing. But it's gonna feel uncomfortable, right? Your ego is going to scream at you that you really need to be doing something more productive than this. And it's not that dissimilar from an alcoholic going through withdrawal, but eventually you find that your heart slows down, right? And the, the sessions, uh, you, you, you find an ability to downregulate and that comes uh, back with you when you re-enter the world. Not only will you feel more peaceful over time during those solitude sessions, but you actually will feel more peaceful in the rest of your life as well. And you'll learn to be comfortable not having to, you know, be in every single meeting just to make sure that your voice gets heard, right? You learn to dissociate yourself to a certain degree, even from those outcomes. Like having outcomes as a business, I think is super important, but attaching your identity to the accomplishment of those outcomes is a recipe for um, sadness and for very a very disordered heart. And so you learn to um, detach your self-worth uh, and your identity from your job. You learn that you are more than a job and you're more than a job title. And so pursue solitude. Uh, you know, you obviously need to coordinate with your family uh, if you're doing anything for sort of an extended period of time, but uh, it might be one of the most powerful things that you can do. 
so hurry, you know, hurry, I think is the great curse of our age in many ways, but uh, with some intentional steps and some deliberate steps and some practice, I think that you can fight back. And there will again be times where you are still busy, probably pretty often, but you'll be more peaceful, you'll be more centered, you'll be more present with the people you care about, you'll be less harried, and you'll probably be healthier as a result.